Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, our special guest, Governor Ivey's Chief of Staff, Joe Bonner. Also, the V-Team takes a look at reopening the session. And Governor Kay Ivey lifts some restrictions. How did she get there? Goldilocks tried a spoonful from the small bowl. Mmm, this porridge is just right. Ah, the old Goldilocks method. <laughs> All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and today I'm joined by Democratic strategist and attorney at law, Beth Clayton. Hello, and, hello, yeah. Hello, and my life partner and uh, constant companion, Susan Britt. Hey, hey, good to see you, girl, even, you're, even though you're just across the pond from me now. I know, I feel like I can see the farm from my house and I, I can't see y'all. It's really heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's awful. Right outside beautiful downtown Atala. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it. again, the numbers are terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, approximately 7,000 confirmed cases in the state. And I think that's a low estimate by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, nearly 1,000 folks hospitalized. Uh, some uh, approaching 300 dead. We have seen an uptick in testing to about 90,000 tests, but some of those are old results coming it's in. It's old right? results. So, and initially, when they were doing the testing, they were required to uh, report the positives that they got back and weren't necessarily required to report the negatives. So last weekend, I think it was, all of those negatives started coming in, right. which uh, false, kind of falsely raised the number right. and caused it to spike. So that wasn't actually a more tests being done, it was just more old results coming in. Right. Uh, I mean, we're failing in testing, but Governor Ivey pointed that out in her press conference earlier this week and said, no, we're not doing enough tests, mm -hmm. but yes, we're going to lift the stay-at-home order and mm -hmm. put in place a safer at-home order bet. I mean, this gradual opening which includes the beaches, uh, the retail retail mm -hmm. stores, and uh, and elective medical procedures. There's a partisan divide here, isn't there? There is, and, and I don't understand why this became a political issue or how it became a political issue, but here we are. Um, and, you know, I, I'll come in, Governor Ivy. I think she's taken the high road and made some tough decisions in this process when people like Governor Kemp in Georgia have taken you know, the easy way out. But I just, I don't understand the logic behind partially opening retail when if you have a clothing boutique, how in the world do you sanitize and make sure that every product that's been touched or tried on is clean and safe for the next person? It just, it seems like maybe, the, I don't know if the retail association lobbyists just did a really good job this week or what, but it just doesn't seem like the most intuitive path forward. Well, I think part of what they're saying is, well, if you can go to a big box store and you can handle the clothes there and you can do all the stuff there, then you're probably just as safe to go to Betty's Beauty Box and, and find a, you know, a new outfit or something like that. Again, this is a, a really tough call, I gotta say. I know, I know she's gotta move. You know, it, it, I agree with, yes, the big box stores are open and you're just a safe course. I'm not going to be in either one of them. But, you know, I, I guess it, it, it could have been worse. We could have opened up more. I mean, that was the recommendations coming out of the task force, which just scared the living daylights out of me. Well, I mean, barbershops, hair salon, nail salon, mm -hmm. closed contact businesses, uh, restaurants, they are closed. One of the things I was kind of shocked at, really, is that some folks have suggested, Beth, and you may want to chime in on this, they've suggested that there is an acceptable amount of deaths, that it's, it, it's okay 
because the economy is struggling, so there's an acceptable loss of life to keep the economy going. Yeah, that's a really pro-life position that people are taking. <laughs> um, I, I don't like. I don't have an answer for that because I thought we were. I mean, I don't know. I'm a Democratic baby murderer or something. I don't know whatever they say. But um, the people who are on the you know don't tread on me, open up the government side of things are the same people who are protesting outside abortion clinics because they don't believe in the needless loss of life. Um, I just I think that there's so much more we could do here. Was I'm sorry. Go ahead. One of the concerning things to me, though, is the Mobile area. You know, they went ahead and, and Ivy opened the beaches, which right. is a little frightening. But the day after the announcement of the beaches being open on May 1st, then the Mobile numbers moved over a thousand cases in that county, moving Mobile County to the top of the list right. of diagnosed cases. Well, and, and Sandy Stimson, the mayor down there, who's done a good job as mayor, he, he came out and said that he was upset that they didn't open the restaurants and the barbershops and other facilities in that area. I mean, I can understand why some people feel safe to go to the beach because there is, there's a way to social distance, but I still don't understand how, one, how any loss of life is acceptable uh, to, to get a job going, and two, that you would want to move so quickly that you endanger People that are coming there as tourists, I mean, you know, if they had a bad experience, like dying, who wants to go back to the beach after death? Yeah. Right. Well, that, and, you know, remember, too, when you have somewhere like, you know, our beautiful beaches, you've got people from Etowah County and Jefferson County and Connecticut County and all of these places coming into one spot. So some counties that are doing better at containing their numbers, <coughs> now all it takes is one family to go from you know, where we are up here in Etowah County, all the way down to the beach, touch something that's been touched by somebody who's been in Mobile County, who's been in an infection risk, and now the whole thing, it's blowing the numbers out of proportion. I mean, but that's right. we, we right. face the same problem being next to Georgia, where people are driving to Georgia to get their nails done and come back. Yeah, and I think, Susan, we got about 30 seconds left here. Really, consumer confidence is you know, just plunged and, you know, people do not have confidence in the economy. Mm -mm. They do not have confidence in what happens next. The majority of people think the stay at home is appropriate. So, I mean, even if they open up businesses, really, how many are going to come? I don't know. I know that when they're talking about uh, opening up these retail businesses, they're only at 50% capacity. So how much... How much business can you get done at 50% of the capacity right. to get your profit margins where they should be? That's right. We're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Coming up next, Chief of Staff, Joe Bonker. What are you doing today, babe? Well, I thought I'd head down the lake with the guys, do a little fishing. Of course, none of us will be wearing our seat belts. I'll lose control of the truck, wrap it around a tree, and kill us all. Okay. Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. I'm John Merrill. As your Secretary of State, my goal is to ensure that each and every eligible U.S. citizen that's a resident of Alabama is registered to vote and has a photo ID. If you're concerned about going to the polls on July the 14th, we want to encourage you to download an absentee ballot application at alabamavotes.gov or contact your local circuit clerk. Make sure you enclose a copy of your photo ID when you submit your application. We may not see you in person, but through absentee, we'll see you at the polls. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We're joined today by our special guest, Governor Ivey's Chief of Staff, former Congressman Joe Bonner. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Joe. Susan, how are you? Bill, it's great to be on your program. I'm honored on behalf of Governor Ivey to spend a few minutes with you and your viewers. Well, well, we're very thankful to have you on. We know you have been in the midst of this fire since day one, but 
crisis is nothing new to you when you served in the U.S. Congress uh, as the chief staff to Sonny Callahan and then in your own right as congressman from the 1st Congressional District. You have seen national tragedies, uh, national collapse in the finance and other man-made man and natural uh, crisis. So I want to ask you, as y'all made the decision to move from the stay-at-home order to the safer-at-home order, how, how, explain to our viewers what that means and then a little bit of how you came to that decision. Well, first of all, uh, the governor early on, as you will recall, was very reluctant to go into a full throttle shutting the economy down. She's a former economics teacher, as you know. And she has said many times that government in and of itself has more opportunity to hurt businesses unintentionally uh, than it does to help businesses through taxation, through regulation, through bureaucracy. So she was very sensitive in the early days about just going into a full uh, bore shutdown of government, uh, shutdown of the economy, shutdown of business. But once the data showed that we needed to go further than the original safer at home uh, order, which is what we now have gone back to, uh, she was uh, very quick to make the decision to go uh, to a stay at home order. But I will tell you the real truth of the matter is, is that the governor has depended on both the data and the recommendations of healthcare experts like Dr. Scott Harris, our state health officer, as well as a team of doctors, businessmen, political leaders. Uh, actually, about two weeks ago, she created an executive committee of her statewide coronavirus task force that includes some of Alabama's most distinguished citizens, Dr. Selwyn Vickers, the Dean of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, Dr. Nancy Dunlap-Johns, a former dean of the University of Virginia and a nationally recognized uh, pulmonary specialist. Uh, Mr. Tim Vines, the president of Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, the Secretary of Commerce, and of course our Finance Director Kelly Butler has chaired that. And so when these recommendations are made, they're made in concert with Dr. Harris, as well as these ideas about reopening, as the governor did this week, the beaches in South uh, Alabama and Mobile and Baldwin counties, all retail operations would be treated uh, equally, as well as medical procedures will be able to restore. All that's done with a lot of people who are offering advice to both the governor and to Dr. Harris. As you've gone through this process, you know, no one's faced a pandemic in over a hundred years, not, not in the United States. What was the mindset of the governor and of your staff uh, that, that assist her in these decisions? I mean, just the thinking process had to evolve, didn't it? Well, Bill, you're right. No one, I guess there are a few people that are alive the last time we had a pandemic, but there are very few people. And I think what we have seen over the last several weeks is, is that we're all learning as we go. And that's painful. And it has inflicted a lot of unintentional pain on a lot of innocent people. But the fact of the matter is, is that as we've learned, we've had to focus on different uh, fires, if you will. I, I equate this a lot of times to fighting fires and putting fires out and keeping fires from spreading. And so early on, we realized that this was a, a disease that there was no vaccine for. Uh, there was no uh, treatment for, really, uh, that we knew of because it is a novel uh, disease. We also realized that we were dealing with life and death matters. Uh, and that's not just something that Governor Ivey realized. It's something that I think the president and all the governors of the 50 states and leaders around the world realized. One fact that's very sobering, but it's a good reminder. In the last six weeks, we've lost more people in the United States of America than we lost during the 20 years that we were involved in the Vietnam War. I used to work in Washington, as you say, and I used to go take visitors down to the Vietnam Memorial and to look at that black granite wall with more than 58,000 names on it. 
And, and just to put your arms around that fact that in the last six weeks, more Americans have died from COVID-19 than the Vietnam War is a reminder. This is a deadly disease. And that's why the governor, Dr. Harris, and others have tried to find that balance between our economic health and our personal health and well-being. So uh, even though restaurants and churches remain closed right now, when do you see those potentially opening and what will that process look like? Well, Susan, they can't open soon enough if it were, if it were up to the governor or to Dr. Harris. I mean, the, the great thing is, is that the, the governor and the state health officer have tried and I think have tried successfully to be on the same page every time they have spoken. And that sends a positive message uh, that we are working closely with the health experts. So just this week, in fact, uh, as we're taping today's show, uh, earlier this week, yesterday on Thursday, uh, we had a wonderful call with our executive committee, with Dr. Harris, uh, as well as with the Alabama Restaurant Association. We had their officers and board members, their association president, we spent almost an hour talking about what the Restaurant Association specifically had done to put safety guidelines in place so that they can reopen. Of course, they've been open, many of them have, not all, to uh, curbside dining and to takeout. But that doesn't work for every restaurant, obviously. Right. But even the restaurateurs will tell you that they can't just reopen on a dime. It's going to take them some time. They actually said between four and seven days to be prepared to go back and get their produce and get their fresh uh, meats uh, to make sure they can get their staff back, get their kitchen staff as well as waiters and waitresses. And so we're working aggressively. We had a meeting yesterday. That was on Thursday. On Friday, there's been more conversations. And the same is true with the Board of Cosmetology. We've been working aggressively with them to try to make sure that barber shops, hairdressers, beauty shops are able to come back as well. The governor somewhat lightheartedly said in her comments this past Tuesday that she's really looking forward to going back to her beauty shop. She hasn't been to in over six weeks because she actually argued with Dr. Harris early on when the recommendation was made to close them. It wasn't being punitive toward them. It's just that they have direct access. They're touching people. You got to touch someone. You got to stand closer than six feet to cut someone's hair. Uh, but she said, well, Dr. Harris, uh, with all due respect, I think that a hairdresser is an essential function of government. And Susan, you can probably appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Oh, Better I can bill. certainly appreciate yeah. that. But we, we well, look, there are, a lot, there are a lot of people who are struggling. There are a lot of people who are desperate. They were denied unemployment. We've had over 400,000 people file for unemployment insurance just in the last month. Last year, we only had 135,000 in the entire year. So a lot of people haven't gotten theirs for whatever reason. The PPP program that came out of Congress uh, has been helpful to some, but not to everyone. Everyone hasn't been approved yet. So there are a lot of people who are hurting, and we feel that hurt. And the governor and Dr. Harris both are passionate about, as soon as we can do this safely, then they will come back together just as they did this week, and they'll announce further openings in, in what she believes should be a measured and thoughtful process. Well, we appreciate all the hard work that the governor's doing, that you're doing, uh, that Dr. Harris is doing. And we want to thank you for joining us today and offering our viewers an inside look at what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you both. And thank you all also for that dashboard that Chip put together. It is, I go to it multiple times a day. And the, the news reporting y'all have done on the political reporter is, uh, nothing short of inspirational because it has truly helped people stay in touch with what's going on during this very challenging time. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank That's you. very kind of you. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our special guest today has been Governor Ivey's Chief of Staff, Joe Bonner. We'll be right back with more news and opinions. What are you doing today? Um, pleasant game. Thought I'd go out for a drive later, maybe. Text some friends while I'm doing it. Scroll through social media. Kill a family four and a hat on collision.
cool, man. Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. I'm John Merrill. As your Secretary of State, my goal is to ensure that each and every eligible U.S. citizen that's a resident of Alabama is registered to vote and has a photo ID. If you're concerned about going to the polls on July the 14th, we want to encourage you to download an absentee ballot application at alabamavotes.gov or contact your local circuit clerk. Make sure you enclose a copy of your photo ID when you submit your application. We may not see you in person, but through absentee, we'll see you at the polls. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Susan, the Alabama House and Senate is set to resume session on May 4th. They have until May 18th to wrap up the business. From what we understand, they want to pass the general fund budget and the education trust fund budget and some local bills. I fear that without press accountability and without public scrutiny, there is a lot that could go wrong. There, there is a quite a bit that could go wrong there. I mean, I think they're kind of rushing us a little bit. We don't, we don't really know what the revenues are going to be coming out of the tax revenues coming out of this because nobody's spending any money right now. So I don't know that they could actually project. We've never, we, this has never happened to Alabama right. before. I mean, we so won't know that until July fifteenth. Exactly. So how are they going to propose these budgets? I mean, it's a requirement they pass not only. Constitution, they passed the budget, but they passed a balanced budget. Right. So I got a feeling there's a whole lot of room for shenanigans in here. Well, Beth, and that's our concern. I mean, and, and the Democrats are basically saying we're not going. Yeah, it, one, it's just not safe to be there. Two, why would the Democrats in a super minority risk their health and safety and that of their family when their votes don't actually make a difference in the overall? lay out of what's happening. I mean, we were all there that night that the eight page school flex bill became what 141 page accountability act. Right. It doesn't yeah. matter. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. Um, but it just, this feels like the accountability act all over again. Well, what scares me is that, you know, they say that the press can hear what's going on in the committee meetings. Last week, our reporters could not hear what was going on in the Senate, but general fund budget. They say they were going to broadcast it live. Anybody that's ever relied on their broadcasting down there, you, you might as well be looking at broadcasting with tin cans. Exactly. They set them in the hall and basically said you can overhear it through the doors. And even the system that's within the state house itself is not that reliable. No. And this is a, a this is a, a recipe for mischief, for stuff to get po put in the education trust fund budget that's bad for schools, that other things that'll be bad for folks. Because uh, if you're a lobbyist, the only way you can get in there is if somebody calls you. Hey, I want to talk to you. they call you and actually make like an appointment with you. Right. But listen, this is not a perfect opportunity for them to level fund. And when you say local bills, that means sending money back home to mama. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. One of the most interesting things, you know, the presumptive uh, nominee for presidential, uh, president for the Democrats is Joe Biden, former. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice President Joe Biden and and Terry Sewell, our congressional leader from the Birmingham Jefferson County area, has been named Beth as one of the the highest contenders for that job. It's a fantastic idea, um, and I was almost embarrassed that I didn't think of it when I read the article. Um, because remember, she's got wonderful ties to the Obamas. She knew both Barack and Michelle before they were the Obamas. Um, and she's a woman in power. She has a lot of weight on the Hill in terms of what she can get done. And she checks all the same boxes of somebody like Stacey Abrams, who people are saying is, you know, a, a red state Democrat who ha can run on progressive values. I mean, Terry Sewell can do all of those things. Um, right. And I think she'd be fantastic. Well, I think she, she's got a lot of experience. I think she would pull a lot of women, a lot of Southern women, mm -hmm. especially a lot of black women. I mean, uh, the, the, Joe Biden has said he's going to appoint a woman. That would be an exceptional pick, I think. I think, and she she's done a fantastic job for Alabama, you know. So we, we she's got a long track record. Uh, I, I think it'd be a great pick. And she got- She's also just somebody who I saw her when Jill Biden was in town 
And she saw me and ran up and gave me a big hug and said, congratulations, you passed the bar. I haven't seen you since you passed. I just wanted to say congratulations. Like she, I'm nobody. She keeps up with that. And she remembers people. And that kind of thing goes a long way when you talk about that secret ingredient to what makes a politician great. Oh, contraire, you are no nobody. I <laughs> <laughs> am though. I mean, she <laughs> Well, I want to talk about one of the wackos out there. Oh, God. Mo Brooks. Say it ain't so, Mo. Mo Brooks is one of these that's come out and basically said, let's let's open up the economy. Sure, people are going to die, but more people will die from the economy being slowed, s- shut down than the COVID. He said this, basically. More okay. people will die. Okay. And he also said, he's, he's kind of hinted at this, oh, it's not as bad as you might think, blah, 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 blah. Well, it turns out that the Campaign Legal Center did a review of financial disclosures of uh, Congress congressional members and found that Mo Brooks did some stock trading right as the coronavirus was kicking in. Now, he wasn't concerned about it, but it looks like from February 2nd until April 8th, somewhere in that period, Mo traded uh, between $18,000 and $95,000 worth of stock. So he wanted out of the market, well, even though he wants us in the streets. Right. I, I guess that really defines what he means by a few deaths is okay, as long as his portfolio looks good. Right? <laughs> How many of your family members, Mo, is it acceptable for them to die so your stock portfolio looks good? Yeah, hey, I don't know no, that. He's no spring chicken either, so I would be careful just being Mo Brooks walking around out there. <laughs> and, and no other senator or House member. House member in Alabama was caught doing this kind of nonsense. Mo Brooks, Mr. Right Wing, all the way, is more concerned about his portfolio. Well, we got about 35 seconds. Uh, Beth, how you been doing? I'm good. I'm good. We've been um, working at Cape Side a lot, keeping the restaurant up and running. Um, and the courts are closed, so hanging out with the pets and just being, waiting on this to all blow over. Yeah. Susan, I see you all the time, but tell folks how you're doing. Doing great. Doing great. Got the greenhouse kicking. That yep. is our uh, saving grace right now. Uh, Going to have lots of fruit and veggies this summer. Well, and that Beth, means... Keep, keep, that, keep your eye open because the... you're going to be in my kitchen this summer. <laughs> I can't as long as this is lifted. <laughs> I you can't either. You can pay me in collard greens. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want all you, our viewers, to stay safe, be strong, and have hope. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them.